In 1994, the Wisconsin Departments of Transportation and Natural Resources and the city of Sun Prairie dedicated the rebirth of a major wetland. The first of its kind in Wisconsin under a new state policy aimed at offsetting loss and damages as wetlands disappear or undergo development elsewhere. The story of this wetland restoration project is an exciting one. Woven with the tales of history and its early cultures, local interest, lawsuits, and state transportation and environmental policy. In times when the government is often criticized for doing nothing or doing the wrong thing, this project serves as an example and as a lesson in what government does right. Two Wisconsin state agencies were largely responsible for the restoration of the 150-acre body of water now known as Patrick Marsh, located at the perimeter of Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, along U.S. Highway 151. Working in partnership, the departments provided personnel and scarce financial resources to demonstrate the state's commitment and leadership in wetland restoration. Together, the DOT and the DNR developed Wisconsin's first wetland mitigation bank site. Department of Transportation Secretary Chuck Thompson provides the DOT's perspective on why that agency took an interest in expending valuable tax dollars to support the environmental initiative. Our normal process that we would be going through would cost us fifty or sixty thousand dollars an acre uh, to produce. Here we're going to create a wetland of hundred and fifty acres for about five thousand dollars an acre, which was a real a uh, pleasant surprise for us and a, we thought a good expenditure of the public funds to not only to preserve wetlands but to create some additional ones. In all of our projects today we have to replace the wetlands that we take and usually it's a replacement of a scale of one to one or one to three and we have this money right into the budget. It does cost us a certain amount of the cost per mile to produce that highway but uh, we feel good about what we're doing. The Department of Natural Resources, with its responsibility for maintaining and preserving the state's wetlands and water resources, saw this project as an extremely important and timely one. DNR Secretary George Meyer talks about his agency's responsibility in the mitigation program. Well, the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Transportation have really a unique partnership in this country. Uh, we work very closely when unavoidable impacts uh, because of highway construction take place, we work to minimize those impacts, but at times it's impossible. We end up with damage to wetlands. So we look for opportunities to recreate wetlands, uh, such as it was the case with Patrick Marsh. It was a very valuable marsh many, many years ago, but then was, uh, was uh, drained for agricultural use, and now it's being reconstructed by the Department of Transportation to provide habitat to offset uh, what was lost. The story formally begins in 1841, at a time when Milwaukee was only a village with some 500 inhabitants. A Scotsman by the name of William Patrick, along with his family, settled on the west shore of a 150-acre lake, a lake undoubtedly carved out thousands of years earlier by the retreating glacier. Calling it Patrick Lake, the family lived there for four years when a David Brazi took up title from the federal government to settle on the east side of the water body. Brazi thought it proper to name the lake after himself, immediately beginning a controversy which would exist for many years. Artifacts such as these shown here demonstrate the Patrick Marsh site had a unique historic relationship with its Native Americans. Just yards from the south shore, a thriving Winnebago community existed in harmony with its surroundings. Water, wildlife, and fish provided staples for existence. Close to this site were trails which enabled the movement and transfer of Indian goods and products from distances far away. In fact, the marsh was a crossroads for these trails. Sun Prairie's historian Peter Klein describes these trails and the legacy of the Native American community. What we tr try to do is map out the routes of all, all the old Indian trails. Uh, here's Sun Prairie, of course. Here, here's the marsh area going down to Kashkadan Creek. This is the old lake. And what we have here, like the different Indian trails that came, we know there was one that came up from the Four Lakes area, just north of where the railroad tracks is by Burke Station. And we can actually trace the route of it, that we could actually map it all the way on the map. And this one came around uh, because it was on dry land. Mm -hmm. It was a dry land route. 
uh, through the Frank Schuster farm, and then ended up at the, old, at, at the southwest shore of the old lake. From there, it branched off, and one went up through Columbus. The other route went uh, west, and it might have followed the lake up this way longer before it branched off. And eventually, it rejoined the path to go up to either to Fort Winnebago or off in the direction of Poinette. By the 1840s, the Winnebagos had left the area. White settlers, who would eventually form the nucleus of a future Sun Prairie, began to arrive. An old cemetery close by still displays the names of early pioneers who left their mark on Patrick Marsh and its surroundings. Names like Brazi, Rank, Stowell, Jackson, Smith, and Egbertson are all part of that early history. It is from these families and others like the Hanleys, Krebs, and Dusheks the story of the last 30 to 40 years unfolds. In 1926, Effa Dushek, a Sun Prairie community civic leader, had this to say as she described the marsh and what it offered. One who has seen the tufted crane wading in the old lake heard the sandpipers call along its shore, followed the flight of the wild ducks that frequent its waters, or looked upon the colorful Indian arrowheads or dull stone hammers turned up by farmer's plow in its bordering fields, has caught something of the spirit of the early history of this attractive little body of water just over the hill, one and one half miles northeast of Sun Prairie. Prior to the 1960s, the Old Lake, as it was called, served in a number of capacities, many of them recreational. Early scenes like these were common. Fishing, primarily for small panfish or bullheads, hunting for waterfowl, or trapping muskrat were common activities. Ice skating, swimming, and boating all added to recreational enjoyment which the water offered. In winter, the lake provided an inexhaustible supply of ice for refrigerating staples which would otherwise spoil in the spring and summer. And of course, all along, the marsh served as a valuable wetland, in essence, a filter for the water which would sustain both human and animal life. Around 1960, the owners of the marsh decided to convert the shallow body of water to productive farmland recognizing that the land beneath the water would be rich in nutrients to support crops, especially corn. Paul Krebs, one of the owner of farmers, describes the conditions and changes during that period. Well, we bought it in the fall of 38, but 39 we owned it, and, uh, and uh, so we farmed that farm mm -hmm. a long time. And then in the early 60s, uh, my dad and Joe Hanley has wanted to tile it, and uh, it had dried up because I put 20 acres, of, I planted 20 acres of sweet corn in there the year prior prior to being any tile in there at all. Okay. And of course with the pumps we could control the water. We could shut the pumps off mm -hmm. and uh, control the, mm -hmm. the, so we had some awful uh, crops of corn back there and sweet corn too uh, over the years. And it was pretty 30 years there I farmed it. You know, there was a lot of times you had to have a log chain with you. You got stuck. Tom Hanley, grandson of former marshland owner Joe Hanley, recalls many of the stories surrounding the decision to drain, as well as a little of the controversy involved. Uh, then uh, the lake went dry uh, in the late 50s, 60s, somewhere in there, and uh, Julius Krebs uh, and Joseph Hanley decided to, uh, to drain the lake and use it for farmland. Uh, they had been paying taxes on this property, and, and the history of the lake, from what I understand it, would go dry every so many years. Uh, also, the lake was used for grazing at one time, and there were fences in the lake. Uh, I can remember some of those fences being out there uh, uh, back in the 50s when I fished there. You could, you could find no fence lines. Very simply, it was a, a situation, from what I can remember, is that there was a, a, a dispute between uh, the landowners and uh, the DNR. Uh, I don't believe it was a long, drawn-out affair. Uh, there were some people that felt that maybe it should stay as a lake 
or as a marsh, but uh, uh, a real large controversy, yes, there was some discussion and controversy uh, by non-vested people along with the DNR versus uh, Hanley and Krebs. The conversion process from water and wetlands to farmland did not happen without the interest of local and state water regulation officials. They raised questions regarding the propriety of losing a water body, which many thought should be part of the public domain. Richard Nitter, a water regulation engineer with the State Department of Resource Development at that time, describes the state's interest and how the resulting issue ended up in Dane County Circuit Court. In 1876, the lake basically was dry. Uh, the farmers in that area were claiming that it was their land and they asked the government surveyors to redo the survey from the original government survey which indicated it to be a pond and under public ownership. Well, the resurvey of 1876 indicated that the lake, the, the government surveyors came in and repatented the land and issued patents to the adjacent owners. Uh, the case then went to Supreme Court, and it was called Bowman versus Sonnix at that time, and the case was decided that basically it was private land because it had been patented by the government. Mm -hmm. uh, my involvement became then in 1964 when I was an engineer with the field, or the Public Service Commission, a field engineer. Uh, water law precluded uh, draining of any natural lake, and we assumed that it was a natural lake. Well. I happened to be driving by one day and I saw a, uh, a drag line out there digging in ditches to put in drain tiles and I immediately reported back to the office and uh, we've got the Attorney General's office involved and started an enforcement action against the owners uh, which were Julius Krebs and Joe Hanley. Um, but they had had the advice and the assistance of the Soil Conservation Service through uh, Harold Drainham Porter, that was his nickname, Drainham Porter. He drained through the federal government about every wetland they could find in Dane County to make corn land out. Um, judge Wilkie was the circuit court judge. Yeah. But uh, after all the testimony, we went through rainfall records, uh, groundwater records. Uh, the basic case was decided, and we lost the case, on the fact that the, the land had been patented by the federal government and given the patents were given to the adjacent property owners. Mm -hmm. The finality of the court's decision would confirm the right of the landowners to farm. In the late 1980s, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation decided it was time to expand State Highway 151, which ran adjacent to the farm site. Traffic studies years earlier had clearly shown the need for a divided double-lane highway. The governor and legislature had finally appropriated the necessary funds, but DOT was faced with certain problems. Among them was the fact that the state of Wisconsin had a policy which required that any loss of wetlands due to construction or development must be restored in some manner at a nearby site. This wetland mitigation policy was Wisconsin's response to the Bush administration's direction that government allow no net loss of wetlands. While the mitigation policy presented an obstacle, it also provided an opportunity. Why not, if possible, restore the old dried up lake? In a partnership, the DOT and DNR joined forces to see what could be done. In 1990, Bill Wambach was the District 1 highway engineer in whose region the dried up lake bed and the new highway lie. He characterizes the process which led up to the restoration. The uh, National Environmental Policy Act was in effect for since 1970, the Wisconsin Environmental Policy Act, both of which required anyone working in a federal, you know, government agency to replace any wetlands that uh, had to be destroyed or covered up in, in doing the improvement. In studying the project, it, it, the inventory indicated that there was about 18 acres of wetlands that had to be destroyed in order to make the second roadway. In a, an interagency meeting between uh, Department of Transportation, Department of Natural Resources, there were discussions of how uh, we would locate places to uh, restore other wetlands or, or buy them and, and preserve them. And during the discussion, um, someone, and I'm not sure who, came up with the thought, probably someone from the Department of Natural Resources, because that's institutional memory about that um, lake that had been drained in the middle 1960s. 
which the uh, predecessor of Department of Natural Resources members didn't like very much at all. But it was private land, and it had been done. But they said, is it possible that we could use that? Now, that pond being like 150 acres was much more than uh, the 18 acres that would need to be restored. And when the staff brought the idea to me, I said, you know, we'll never convince the Federal Fish and Wildlife Service to, to do that because it would require them to approve a uh, wetlands banking project. We hadn't done that in Wisconsin before. Very few had been done around the whole country. Meaning that uh, you would replace this, uh, you know, buy this wetland and preserve it, and then just take the 18 acres from that bank of 150 and uh, some future project where you could not find some suitable one, you'd say you need another 20 acres, take 20 acres off, and it would cover several projects. At the same time, Hal Meyer, an environmental impact coordinator with the DNR, who is generally credited with this particular banking restoration project, began to talk to his superiors about the project's potential to demonstrate the value of wetland mitigation banking. It occurred to me it might be appropriate to consider a banking site, and so uh, uh, it, I started looking for a potential site that they could that could be utilized. Even though the DNR had that had not at that time even given any consideration to a wetland mitigation bank, uh, so when, at any rate, when DOT approached me with the Highway 151 project between uh, Sun Prairie and Columbus, after we were g going through some of the very very preliminary. Uh, design process in terms of wanting to locate the corridor, it became perfectly obvious that they were going to impact a number of wetlands in the process, even though many of the wetlands that were impacted were not of very high quality. But it became obvious that it was going to take a sizable wetland restoration activity in order to compensate for the wetlands that were lost through that construction activity. And so I, um, ha having been familiar with the history of Patrick Lake, or it was called Brazy Lake in those days, mm -hmm. it occurred to me that it might be appropriate to at least consider looking at that site. And so I did talk to Jim March about it. Jim thought it was a great idea, and both of us went to talk to Jim Huntoon, who obviously was assist the uh, Southern District Director at that point in time. And Jim also bought into the idea very quickly, and uh, at which point we then talked to uh, George Meyer, who was the uh, uh, the division administrator at that point in time for uh, environmental enforcement or for enforcement, mm -hmm. which included my program, and I we asked George on a conference call if if he would buy into this concept of doing this as a pilot project, if it would be the first wetland mitigation bank site in the state of Wisconsin, and he agreed very quickly. Less than two years after the idea emerged, necessary approvals were received, and the state purchased the land. Pumps which had been keeping the lake bed dry were removed, and local residents began to see the restoration of their old lake, perhaps more a marsh by today's standards. Today, oversight for the marsh has been turned over to the DNR's wildlife management program. Ellen Crossley is the wildlife biologist in charge and talks about the changes, the value added, and the great potential for the future. He also comments on the encroaching residential and commercial development. Since it was restored in 1992, we've gone from an area that was about three feet deep, deep all the way across, about 120 acres in size, full of aquatic vegetation, probably I think about 28 different species of aquatic plants, and a real diversity of uh, what we would call puddle ducks and, and uh, water, water loving birds that need a lot of vegetation to nest in. We've gone from that situation in 92 to the situation that we're in today in 96. It really does look like a lake out there. It looks a lot like uh, one of the pictures that I saw in the Sun Prairie Sesquicentennial calendar a few years ago um, from the late 1800s. It's just almost no emergent vegetation. It's about seven feet deep, about covering about 160 acres in size. And the, the, uh, the bird life has changed dramatically. Uh, at one point we had, uh, uh, several years ago, I think it was 1993, 94, we had 70 to 80 coot nests, American coots, nesting out there. Today, we have just a few coots out there. We had sora rails nesting out there. We had redhead ducks nesting out there. We had a lot of blue-winged teal and mallards in the uplands. But they were all there because of all the emergent vegetation. And now, 
what we see is birds that like to eat fish and like an open water, almost a lake type situation. There's a lot of cormorants out there that are feeding on the fish there. We have uh, a number of threatened and endangered species that are hanging out out there. The red neck grebe, common terns, and egrets, all of which rely on, food, on a fish as part of their food base. They couldn't have survived or made a living there in 92, 93, or 94 because there was a lot of vegetation and almost basically no fish whatsoever. Now that we've seen this dramatic transformation, the wildlife has, has changed dramatically as well. I'm just convinced that uh, we're in a high water period right now and eventually it's going to dry down, it's going to ch get chock full of vegetation. So patience is going to be the virtue here uh, to see how this thing uh, looks and what it looks like years to come. When we first uh, were there in 1992, the frog and toad survey was done and the only thing that was heard out there were uh, where it was the American toad. This is a standard survey technique that's used all around the state to monitor marshes. And all that was seen or heard was the American toad. Now, uh, we have out there, and in fact, most of these species were there by 1993 or 94. We've got uh, uh, tiger salamanders are out there. Uh, painted turtles came in for the first time in 1995. We have, uh, we have uh, green frogs. We have leopard frogs. We have chorus frogs. Uh, we have some tree frogs, and in 1993 we heard a bullfrog, but I think it must have been something that a kid dropped off because no one ever seen or heard from it again. So we've had a, a dramatic change in, in the, uh, the amphibians and reptiles in terms of those four-legged critters and them coming back to the marsh and calling the marsh their home. Who were the real forces behind this important project? Names like Dr. Robert McCabe, a UW wildlife ecology professor, James Huntoon, DNR district director, Dr. James March, DNR Deputy District Director, Bill Wambach, Jim Merriman, Hal Meyer, Dick Knitter, the Hanleys, Paul Krebs, Judge Jack Olive, and many others, all have had a role in the ultimate success of this effort, a legacy representing the work of countless people in countless ways. Where will the story go from here? Will it end, or will the project prove to be a Wisconsin and national pace setter for wetland restoration? DOT's Secretary Chuck Thompson provides his view. Well, I think the uh, Corps of Engineers and uh, St. Paul, uh, our own people in the DOT, uh, other agencies, Federal Highway Administration, have all used this as kind of a good example of what can be done in preservation of uh, wetland areas and restoring them. Uh, we have many farms in the state of Wisconsin that have been tiled, are really not good farmland today that we could utilize for wetland banking and maybe create not a lake but a good wetland for the birds and the wildlife to, to live in. DNR Secretary Meyer too is confident that the Patrick Marsh project will prove to be a valuable lesson for the future. We're looking at this as a model for other highway projects throughout the state. Uh, it has great visibility right off Highway 151 and many people see it and see that it is a success and I think it does provide an opportunity to recreate uh, wetland habitat in areas where it has been destroyed southern southeastern Wisconsin uh, as a means of offsetting uh, those damages that will occur from other highway projects throughout the state. I really think it can be a national model for this. Local interest abounds. In general the Sun Prairie community feels that the project was a good one. Adjacent landowner Tom Hanley expresses views about his feelings on the project and its future. I think it's a good project. Uh, I think we need some of these projects and uh, uh, that's why I pushed for it to be done once they, the DOT decided that they would, would were interested in buying it and, 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 and working their deal out with the DNR. Local officials are pleased with the result. Sun Prairie's Mayor Joanne Orphan talks about the value the city places on the marsh and about the potential future value of this project. Uh, there are obviously many, many children and many, many adults who don't have the opportunity to come out and enjoy the, the character of, of the, uh, the countryside and, and uh, uh, looking at this also as a historic site so it has educational and, and historic and, and natural uh, significance in terms of what we can learn out here. Uh, I think the, the opportunities are endless. 
Well, I would certainly like sufficient lands to be set a, a, aside on the perimeter. Uh, sufficient, that is, in, in uh, acreage and topography to support uh, what it, we see developing out here. I, I have the feeling that even the professionals are somewhat surprised at how quickly this has developed and how much flora and fauna has moved in in a relatively short period of time. My concern would continue to be that there would be development encroaching uh, in some of these areas which would, number one, uh, perhaps endanger what we are allowing to develop, but also would detract from. And this is very lovely, very pristine, and it's very difficult uh, to come up with, with this kind of uh, uh, ambiance in this area of the, uh, the state. The fact is that we cannot be certain how this effort, significant as it appears, will affect the future. But one thing is certain. Today, a restored body of water exists to serve as a home for flora and fauna, flowers and wildlife, fish and birds in countless numbers. Once used as cropland, the marsh today provides enjoyment to users who find comfort in their new wildlife area, perhaps repeating what William Patrick saw when he came here in 1841. This entire project abounds in educational opportunities for state agencies, for local residents wanting to learn about wildlife, but most certainly for the thousands of young school children who now have a living laboratory close at hand. The excitement from these young learners tells the story about the real value. If the state's wetland mitigation banking policy and this resulting marsh lake are the products of government's wisdom, then our environmental future looks bright. Since the mid-1800s, Wisconsin has lost millions of acres of valuable wetlands. This is another effort to redeem the past. I think that wetland banking makes lots of sense. And there are some excellent examples along the Baraboo River, uh, along the Embarrass River, along the Wolf River. All across the state, we have great opportunities to continue to do the same type of thing that we have done in the last five years.